Hey, it's Alex Radcliffe from Board Game Co. And it's time for another Monday Roundup. Lots of stuff as usual. Not as long as last week. We will have timestamps in the comments. Not in the comments. We'll have timestamps in the description down below. So feel free to jump around to whatever section you are interested in and all that. Including, if you're interested, when I talk about Feed the Kraken, I just played that game. So feel free to jump there if you also want a little mini review baked in as well. Um, in a new tradition that I want to have fun with, I'm going to predict the, the length of time of this video. And I'm going to come in at this one as not as long as last week, not as overwhelming. I'm going to come in at 43 minutes. Let's see how that plays out. We're going to go with 43 minutes. That is my prediction. Uh, let's go in from there. So jumping off there, we starting with Harry Potter, Catch the Snitch, a wizard sports game, which I don't know if this is, yeah, I did want this one first. So Harry Potter, Catch the Wizard, basically this one, Catch the Snitch, not the wizard. This is one that they basically, Night Games created the game and it was off to a rocky start. Now a rocky start is obviously take a grain of salt. $64,000 is not a small amount of money, but for an IP with miniatures, Harry Potter, you know, the whole Quidditch everything it's one that could have been raking in a lot more and there are a bunch of reasons for that part of it's going to be the high price point part of that's going to be the fact that they kind of try to upsell you into getting Harry Potter and a bunch of key characters Draco Malfoy Harry Potter all these other things but they try to upsell you them as buying them as an expansion so this Harry Potter Quidditch game didn't have Harry Potter which I think was a drastic misstep it's a misstep that they realized because they kind of said when they come back for the you know the relaunch they will be adding that I will also note their update was a little weak now I I I try to be balanced here because I think this was ridiculous to be frank but I'm also sympathetic to either communication differences or or something that's just missteps. Uh, so I'm not like trying to trash the company now in the slightest, but they they tackle this uh, cancellation as basically blaming the election and internet traffic and all that, and didn't really take any accountability for the fact that there were a bunch of missteps on their end. If you pay attention to the comments, you pay attention to the communication, there were missteps on their end, and then they're like, we're canceling it because of the election and we'll come back, which is, is a little weak, not the best response in my opinion. Either way, this is a game that's still going to have interested people. For, my, for myself, I haven't looked into it enough to see if the gameplay interests me, but I am interested in the miniatures alone. My daughter loves Harry Potter. My, all my kids love Harry Potter. She loves the books. They love the movies. That is Harry Potter. Two minutes on a canceled Kickstarter. Next up, we have the King's Army, the Tower Defense board game. This is one that very sadly canceled. This is one that was trending up to a degree, but then they had started having a lot of mid-cancellations and whatnot. He's been working on this particular Kickstarter. He talks about it in the update when he talks about the cancellation, but John's been working on this Kickstarter for apparently like six years uh, in terms of the, the next iteration of King's Armory. There's a lot of content here. They plan on taking time. We're coming back eventually, but this, there's no clear date on the when or the how or the whatever. They, will plan, they plan on coming back to tackle the Kickstarter again and hopefully deliver an experience that loops people in. It could be anything from just having a, I, I don't know, I'm not going to get into their plans, but I wish them all the best. I hope this funds. Uh, keep in mind, $75,000 on what is effectively a small, not indie indie, but like a smaller project is nothing to sneeze at. It's just that their goal was higher than that and they weren't hitting that goal. From there, we have Nova Aedis Renaissance. So this is going to be the section where I talk about my picks of the week, which is specifically games ending, campaigns ending in the next seven days that I believe you are worth backing from the stance of value for your dollar. To be clear, this does not include, in all my co uh, coverage, I talk about whether you could could have back it, should back it, safe back, all that stuff. This specifically is ones that are a solid good back, in my opinion, and hopefully I'll be right over time. But Nova Aedis Renaissance falls into that category. Despite my comments about some of the issues they've had in the past i believe that the amount of content you're going to get here for this game this will be a solid hold this value for a decent amount of time uh, over time everything does drift down so i'm not commenting five years from now but i believe this is a solid pick over the next week uh, if you are interested in the game go ahead and check it out it does not mean that the game is your type of game if you're not interested in a 28 mission campaign game then this might not be for you if you're not interested in miniature combat and dice rolling this might not be for you but if you're interested in the game i believe nova edis is a solid back that is worth Worth jumping in on because it's going to be your cheapest option to get this much stuff at this point again i do have critiques i have critiques of a bunch of different small stuff but at the end of the day still a solid solid back uh, next up, we have Freedom 5, a Sentinels Comics board game, which is going to be the other game that is ending in the next week that I believe is a solid back. They just posted an update that they'll be coming back with even more information and more pledge levels and all these things. This is one that I believe will solidly hold its value. Uh, despite my own critiques of some aspects of the fiddliness, I still want it in my collection. I still plan on adding this to my collection. And I think that this is going to be a best opportunity to get a ton of paint painted miniatures, deluxe components. This is going to be an experience that people are going to want to get their hands on. I believe this is a solid back back assuming we're talking the upper pledge levels and not the uh in, in, you know the retail options and whatnot uh for these two campaigns nova edis and freedom five and endless winter 
and Dire Alliance and Houndsfolk Tussle. Uh, I will be doing an update video later this week where I go through all the updates, changes, everything new since the beginning of the campaigns. So I'll have a solid, uh, just full update video on those five, which I'm not going to dive into them in this video. Those five are going to be covered later this week. I believe Wednesday, we'll see how it plays out. Uh, probably either Wednesday or Thursday, there'll be a solid full update video with those five campaigns. Any changes, updates, optional buys, additions, all that fun stuff. So stay tuned for later this week. And if those are the campaigns you're, if those are the only campaigns you're interested in, then pleasure having you, and I will see you Wednesday or Thursday or something else. From there, we go to Penny Dread Fund. This is the section of campaigns that are not currently funding and a quick overview into those campaigns. Uh, Penny Dread Fund is a cooperative deck building adventure with a touch of steampunk, touch of mythos. Uh, it, has, it has an interesting, you know, looks interesting. It has miniatures. I think the highest, the biggest problem this one's currently facing is the fact that it is a fairly expensive entry pledge to get in there. You're talking about 100 bucks to get in on this game. That's going to be because there's miniatures in this game. So I understand why the price point exists. Nonetheless, I think they're just not seeing enough uh, adoption, enough hype around that game. Uh, we'll see if it tra we'll see if it ends up backing. It will hopefully back. It is trending in the right direction, but 12 days to go. I mean, they've, they, it's a very short campaign. I think it only launched like three or four days ago, so it's not bad. We'll see how it plays out. Hopefully they back. Hopefully they fund. Uh, they also have a Tabletopia implementation. Speaking of which, something I'm going to be trying to add at the end of my videos because I often forget while I'm going through it is just a list of all the campaigns I cover that week that have a Tabletopia implementation. So I'll be mentioning this one as well at the end. But yes, if you want to try it on Tabletopia then go ahead and check it out. Next up, we have Scourge of the Seas, a pirate-themed board game. This is another one of the Tabletopia implementation. This is one is having trouble getting off the ground or a lot of adoption. 41 backers, 22 days to go. Looks like a fun, simple pirate game. Uh, I debated even bringing this to the table, bringing it to the table, but I did because of the Tabletopia implementation. So if you want to try this out, quick, fun, simple game and see if it's for you, go ahead and check that one out. See, try it free on Tabletopia. Next up, we have the Blue Wings, a custom deck for Scat, which I am not talking about the value on this one. Rather, I am talking about this one today because I had several people who specifically asked for coverage on this one. And so I was like, hey, I will introduce it to as many people as I can in that sense. Uh, the value aspect is going to fall into the category of it's a small deck of cards. So if it makes its way to retail, it's probably just going to be cheaper at retail. It's very hard for, for uh, creators to offer a good deal the smaller the game gets. Just the logistics involved in any of these things, it just gets very hard when compared to buying something online. Uh, Scat, this is going to be the Blue Wings deck, which is a custom deck for the game of Scat. The game of Scat is a very popular game in Europe, uh, specifically Germany, I believe, but I think Europe in general, and it has not become as popular in the U.S. It is considered to be one of the greatest three-player card games, and I've heard it mentioned multiple times over the years. One of the reasons that this creator, the Blue Wings, what they're trying to do is they believe that part of the adoption issues in uh, Scat is that if you're not born with it, if it's not one of those games like Spit or War or whatever it is, then there is a bit of a mental juggling trying to make all the math work in terms of the numbers that you have to play with because it's played with a basic deck of, deck of cards and they have these weird rules like well the jacks are actually not counted in this and the jacks are going to have different ordering uh, depending on their suits you have to know that and then these cards are an exception here an exception there so they have all these like things that you could play it with the deck of cards but ultimately and unfortunately it will be uh, hard to pick up so this game is meant to replace that deck of cards and give you a more intuitive and easy way to learn scat without having to uh, worry about you know teaching people all these exceptions there we have, from there we have Core Space, uh, Firstborn. This is going to be an update video, just an upda update on Core Space. Must minor, minor update, nothing particularly amazing. I talked about it last week, but at, in that video, I mentioned that I was turned off because I'm just not interested in anything that involves using a ruler to move. Uh, that's more of a miniature game thing, and I'm just not interested in that. And I got several comments pointing out that, that there are other ways to play the game where you don't have to use a ruler to move, where you can move based on hexes or whatever it is, meaning they have more of a miniature style approach. They also have more of a board game style approach to the game uh, in case anyone was watching that video and was equally turned off the way I am by a miniatures game then it's worth knowing noting that I got that 100% wrong there are both options in the box so and that's something I saw from someone else who was saying that some other creator where I saw him saying well he wasn't interested in the game because of that and I went with that unfortunately which I should not have but basically yes so this has both miniatures on a grid movement like a board game as well as uh, moving with rulers or whatnot like a miniatures game so just updating you in that sense and from there, we get to the new stuff, the new stuff. So Librarian's Adventure card game, by the time you're watching this, there are hours to go because unfortunately I missed out on this. This is not on my list. It does happen from time to time where a campaign just isn't on my list for some reason or once in a while it's on my list and I still somehow miss it, which is unfortunate. It's not my, my goal, but it's a reminder. If you ever want to see a campaign that I didn't cover in that week's video, 
ping me because I may well have a plan that I'm, yeah, yeah, don't worry, I'm getting to that next week. That very often will be the case. But if you want to be certain that it'll be covered, make sure to message me in the comments for anything you want to see so that I can add it to my list. Because I, I saw librarians and I was like, yeah, I've seen Facebook ads for that. I don't know why it's not on my list. I don't know what happened there. And sure enough, in any case, going to the Librarian's Adventure card game. This is by Everything Epic. Everything Epic is most famously known for, I think, Shadows of Brimstone? Not, no, that might be a different game. They are most famously known for a different game. Let me see if I can find it here. Uh, Secrets of the Lost Tomb. Okay, that, that, I think, is their most popular title that they've brought to the table. They have a bunch of other titles. Big Trouble in, Lo in Little China is hard to get. Como Ward is a recent one. Uh, Rambo is a really recent one. They have a bunch of options, but I think Secrets of the Lost Tomb is their generally best done, mo most well-known title from Kickstarter or whatnot. Uh, the Librarian's Adventure Card Game is going to be a cooperative adventure card game uh, based on the Librarian's TV show with art and stills from the TV show that it falls into an interesting middle ground for me. Uh, I tend to be pretty, per I tend to be pretty dismissive of things like this in general. I find that the mass market adoption of a popular franchise of a popular title generally does a pretty poor job holding its value because you're targeting a very specific subset of people. At the same time, they have a decent amount of reviews up, including a review from One Stop Co-op Shop, who's generally pretty frank with his opinion. So if he says he likes something, I tend to trust it. And so One Stop Co-op Shop seems to like the game, has a lot of promise about it. I don't know if he's keeping it long-term or not, but he had generally pretty positive things to say. I do recommend watching that review because that is a big part of my hesitation of just writing this off as something that will not do a good job holding its value. Uh, as far as the pledge levels, there are a few pledge levels over here. The first is the $60 Librarian's Adventure card game. The retail copy of the game will certainly not be that much. That being said, this does have extras and exclusives and whatnot, although let's go through those. So that $60 pledge level is going to give you, if I can find it over here, it's going to give you, okay, let's see if we can find it. There are stretch goals here. Uh, so all these are, most of these, it says all stretch goals are Kickstarter exclusive and limited edition. These will not be in the core box and not be in retail. That's the good news in terms of value. The bad news is it's all cosmetic and the type of cosmetic that people don't tend to care about as much. We have a foil artifact set, which is basically foil treatment on the artifact cards. It does not seem to be extra anything else, just foil treatment. So it's not new cards, it's uh, deluxified cards. We have alternate art for cards. We have a card storage box. We have an alternate art set two. Divider cards, alternate art set three. Hero deck boxes, alternate art set four. Uh, library donations and then this whole thing which is currently unknown so this add-on season two wave to the band's adventure card game i mean we have 34 hours to go while I'm, I'm recording this and i don't know what this is going to play out to but basically everything up until this and this does represent an unknown so check this if there's any update by the time uh, you watch this video to see if anything changed but as far as the rest of it it is all fairly cosmetic standard stuff like alternate art set and foil things those things tend to not do as good a job holding its value if you're interested in the basic pledge i recommend just waiting for retail i think the gap in pricing between 60 dollars plus shipping i recommend waiting for retail you'll get it significantly cheaper than that that being said the other options are much better for a hundred dollars you are getting two expansions including two kickstarter exclusive expansions well just to be clear two expansions which are two Kickstarter exclusive expansions, not four expansions. So you're going to be getting the base game and all the stretch goals, as well as the fact you'll be getting two full expansions, both of which are Kickstarter exclusive. If this game does well, if this game picks up a following, if this game, uh, you know, for whatever reason, again, it's a little bit tricky because it's Kickstarter exclusive expansions, but if this game is well liked and if enough people are trying to hunt down the game, then the Kickstarter exclusive expansions will make, uh, will help it significantly in holding its value. Uh, $100 at the same time is fairly steep. This falls into that category. I hate this category, by the way. I, I generally like, like having an opinion. This falls, falls heavily into the category where I'm just not sure. I can see it easily tanking and I can see it easily doing well. I don't don't know which way to go my big recommendation would be if you get it jump in at the hundred dollar pledge or as well if you want all the extras the high quality art prints the custom metal dice or the the neoprene mat then jump in at 145 i recommend skipping on the 60 uh the hundred is a bit of a toss-up so uh make your own decision accordingly and i'm sorry that i can't be uh more certain on this one moving on from there we have raid a viking card game the art on this game is Gorgeous, absolutely gorgeous. I'm loving the the. Uh, there's a word for minimalistic. I'm loving the minimalistic and yet very beautiful design approach to this game. Uh, if you recognize the art style from Beasts of Balance, then that's because it's the same company that brought you Beasts of Balance. So that's why uh, the game looks amazing. That well, that's not true. The game art looks amazing. The game play looks intriguing. I don't see a bevy of reviews or opinions that make me confident in the gameplay, and that leads to basically me saying it's a uh, seems like a you know back it if you want to, but also probably not a good back category. Now what I mean by that is we have two pledge levels. This is a two-player card game. You're gonna get two decks, and you have pass cards back and forth. I think there's drafting. I'm not sure. I recall 
all seeing the war drafting. Uh, but yes, in terms of the pledge levels, for $20, you're going to get the standard edition pledge. That is going to be a $25 MSRP, but you are also paying shipping here. So basically, that standard edition pledge, you just, you know, you may as well just get it at retail for cheaper and not pay shipping. So again, unless you want to support the creator, that is always a value system you have to take into account yourself. Your desire to get the game, your desire to appeal to your own FOMO, your desire to support the creator, those are all value systems you have to take into account. I am just commenting in general on these videos, I'm commenting on the, the economic value. Are they giving you a financial reason to back or not? And you can take that and incorporate it into your own other tiered system. Um, and by the way, I've made exceptions in the past and I continue to make exceptions. Uh, if I'm, if I saw more reviews of this game talking about how great it was, I'd be inclined to make an exception. The art looks great. I'm just not prepared to take a risk on it because even though it looks great, I think I can get it cheaper later and wait for reviews and everything else. So the waiting for reviews is more of a bigger part for me. Uh, in terms of the Kickstarter exclusive edition for $25, so an additional $5, you're going to get the Kickstarter exclusive edition, which comes with a the Kickstarter exclusive game box and tarot art card art. So the retail edition is just going to give you over here, just going to give you those two decks. So you can get deck one, deck two. Uh, part of the problem here is even with the $25 MSRP, you just these, these things are going to be available for like 15 bucks at retail. I can't imagine it being significantly more than that. It's two decks of cards. Uh, that's not, not a lot you can ask for that. Yes, the art will help with holds value but only to a degree and then from over there at $72 we get the designer set and that's going to give you you know the neoprene I think no it gives you uh, the base game the Asgard expansion pack and the raid t-shirt I think everyone gets the Asgard expansions back nope nope that is the no that's just that okay there we go so as far as the which one should you back or not like I said I, I kind of would wait for retail if you're looking at the financial aspect but if you're on the fence about something I would back at the Kickstarter exclusive edition $25 pledge level from there, we get to Neomorphosis Infestation, which is really more of an update video, so I guess I should have put this earlier in the queue. But Neomorphosis Infestation is a... It's its, it's struggling along. This is one I talked about briefly last week. Uh, it's struggling. It, they had the Kickstarter originally back in January. They got to roughly... I can't remember exactly. Roughly 180000 maybe 190000 And then they canceled, unfortunately. And then they came back now, which is... Good. Relaunches are good, but the longer you wait, it can be problematic because you lose a lot of people who were interested. And additionally, this is just a very busy season for Kickstarters. Lots Lots of lots of good looking stuff and I think it's struggling in that sense again keep in mind two hundred twenty thousand dollars is not struggling it's just in comparison to what they thought they would do better and clearly they aren't uh, in terms of backers right now the problem is they did something I just talked about uh, I put a video yesterday about Kickstarter early birds I recommend checking that out it talks about stuff like this but they basically put up an early bird pledge and you can jump in and get a early bird pledge for the game and you get something extra the problem is if you change your mind you're dropping out and now you're losing funding you're losing backers early birds are a double-edged sword they generally can help a campaign they can also hurt a campaign like i said watch yesterday's video for a full deep dive on that subject uh, as far as the campaign i hope it does well i want to see more stuff they have iterated and changed towards adding daily i don't know if it's daily but consistent just bonuses for hey thanks for still being here with us and here's another bonus and they said they will not be canceling this time around uh they talked about they said like last time they saw things they could improve upon so they did so and this time around they already improved upon it so it is what it is and it's going to go towards completion towards the end uh, for myself i am interested in the game and i believe it'll hold its value i talked about this last week so i will probably be backing it myself i'll probably be keeping my pledge uh, there's enough things that are interesting about the game that i think it has a potential space on myself next to games like Zombicide, like Besiege, like whatever. Uh, in terms of whether it'll hold, it's, whether it'll stay in that collection, I don't know. I will be trying it as soon as I'm getting it. As soon as I get it, I will try it and see if it's for me. Either I will like it, I will like what it, like what it adds to the table, what new things it brings, or I will be selling it while the market is still interested in those games. Uh, you know, just people who miss out on the campaign who are like, Neomorphosis, I want Neomorphosis. This is the whole premise of all these value conversations I have about Kickstarter. Next up, we have Feed the Kraken. Feed the Kraken, which I did a live playthrough. You can check it out on uh, Game for Life VG, so you can go ahead and subscribe down below. I will put a link if you would like to subscribe to our channel. Uh, but I had a live playthrough of this game, so feel free to check that out in terms of seeing my impressions as I go along. And you will see my impressions as I go along. You'll get a feel for what my thoughts were on the game. And in terms of giving you my thoughts on the game, it's not going to be a full review. I've only played the game one time, but which I don't mind doing a review of a game I've played once, but I'd rather at least have a game in front of me and give it a few more plays but in any case uh feed the croc and before we get into the value conversation i really enjoyed this game i 100 plan on adding this to my collection whether i do it on kickstarter or not i don't yet know and i'll get into that in the value part 
but in terms of the game itself, I wanted to plan on adding to my collection. It is thoroughly enjoyable. Uh, our game was online and took roughly two hours, but they say in person should take around 45 minutes to an hour. I have no problem believing that. The amount of hoops we were jumping through to play it online, it's, it's not ideal. And I can totally see this playing in the 45 to hour range, and I love the gameplay for what it delivers in that punch. And my thing with uh, hidden hidden roll games is I don't like three hour hidden roll games. I've talked about this in the past. I just find that if someone realizes you're bad or realizes you're whatever, you're now stuck in a three hour game and you're not having fun. Uh, for me, One Night Ultimate Werewolf, it will always, not will always, is currently one of my favorite hidden roll games because of the fact that if you're having a bad game, it's seven minutes of a bad game. You can just, you know, move on to the next one and reset. Uh, resistance is great, but that comes in more to half an hour range. Feed the Kraken at 45 minutes to an hour, I think is a, a little higher but still a range that can deal with in case you are caught out early. Additionally, one of the things I liked about this game, so let's talk about the, before we go into whatever, let's talk about the basic gameplay. The basic gameplay is you have, let me see if I can find a better picture of the board, better picture of the board, if we can find it here. So the gameplay involves you're either a pirate, I think I'm just going to go back to that original board there. Okay, so going to this board over here, up here, over here. So, over here on this board, you're either a pirate. Let's take let's take a six-player game like the game we had. So then there's be three pirates, uh, three loyal sailors, two pirates, and one cultist. The cultist wants to get the ship to this cultist spot in the middle. The pirates want to navigate the ship this way, and the loyal sailors want to navigate it that way. And there's a sequence of picking different cards, and then picking. You have two players, two players who pick cards, add them to the box, and then one player, the navigator, who picks from that box. So everyone can blame everyone else. The navigator could be like, I had to direct it the wrong way because those were the only cards available to me. And other people could be like, you liar, you can't believe you said that. There's all this uh, subterfuge, or, you, or not even liar, you could say, yeah, I had to put it in the box, those are the only cards I drew. There's all these lying and adjustments you can make in terms of either head-to-head -head lying to just, you know, direct someone's face, or, you know, just lying about what your options were on the table when you did something. Lots of clever interplay in the way the different roles play out and the way different roles can be an obvious lie or not. So it's very interesting in that sense. Uh, the cultist acts as a basically a stabilizer, a balancing act, because the cultist wants to head towards the middle. So inherently, the cultist ends up directing the ship counter to the team that's currently winning. If the pirates are currently winning and, and it's moving all the way to red, the cultist is effectively going to end up allied with the loyal sailors as it tries to direct it more towards the middle. So the cultist acts as a fascinating balance of uh, of, of the game mechanics. Additionally, there's ways for the cultist to spread its cultishness, cultishness into other players and then consider, continue, and hopefully win that way. There are a lot of interesting things that happen along the way, from the idea that you can have certain cabin checks where you end up checking someone's roll card and then more direct lying or not. Uh, there are are different tokens you can play on the board in terms of different options, in terms of giving you different abilities. Each player has their own character ability. And one of my favorite things is there's this gun mechanic of taking control from the captain. And the reason I love that is it seemed from our game, and there's a moment, if you watch the playthrough, there's a moment when I realized this and I was like, oh my gosh, I'm so intrigued. Which is this idea that if you play it right, you can get to a point in the game where people know you're a pirate and you still have enough guns between yourself and the other pirates that you can maintain control of the captainness of the ship, whatever it is, and still win. I mean, this is not a game where, okay, great, we found out who you are, so now we inherently will win the game. If you found out who the pirates are, yes, that's a good thing for you. But the pirates, if they've planned well and they've kept their roles and they have their guns, they can still basically control the ship nonetheless. It works really well. That that applies to the other direction as well, by the way. You can figure things out and still manage to keep degrees of control in the game, which I, I like a lot. I think the game is a solid game. I think it will be added to a lot of game shelves. I think a lot of people will be very, very happy with this game. And like I said, I plan on adding it to my collection. I love hidden role games in general. My biggest problem is they all seem to occupy the same space. It's a question of did you do something new that makes it worth adding to my collection? And Feed the Kraken 100% does something new. So color me interested in this game. As far as the value pledge or whatnot, the value proposition, so that's where it's less good news. Not bad news, less good news. This is uh, going to be, there's going to be two options on the table. There's going to be the 47 uh, euro, $56 Feed the Kraken basic pledge. This is going to come with the base game and all unlocked rewards from social goals. Uh, Fun Tales in general, they do, they take a stance of, which is an, an admirable stance, it's just it's not as great for Kickstarter. Fun Tales takes a stance of, we're making the game the same thing for everyone and everyone will enjoy it. We're not hiding game content behind Kickstarter so that other people can't get the full product down the road. The problem with that is then you have to look at just price alone and price alone 
own, this will probably be cheaper in retail. If you're looking at that basic pledge, you can almost certainly get it cheaper at your online game store down the road. When is obviously a question. You know, when will this hit retail? This is slightly different than Glenmore, which I covered from last time. Glenmore, Highland Tales, Highland Lands, or whatever, in the sense that uh, that one is an already adopted game. It's a game that people already like. People already have it. You know, um, people already had the interest in the base game, and so it was one that will be more quickly entering retail as opposed to this one may have to set up retail partnerships people who are interested in the game people who agree to get the game or whatnot uh and but the good news though is that higher pledge level the deluxe pledge level is one that first of all more people are backing it we have 287 at the base pledge and 1169 at the deluxe pledge i completely agree with that i'll go through what's covered in that pledge shortly but basically the deluxe pledge is also tentatively available later it's not kickstarter exclusive at the same time as a deluxe pledge especially on a new game it is unlikely that you will be able to consistently get your hands on this copy, meaning they, they, cover, they said this themselves, they said it's going to be a more limited print run. Now, obviously, if there's enough demand, that means things will be printed out. If people are, if, if game stores are selling out of the few deluxe pledges they have, then eventually more will be reprinted. But the cycle, the time delay in terms of when you can potentially get a Feed the Kraken deluxe pledge, or even just the aspect of limited versus not limited, those things are giant questions, meaning I have no clue what reliability, what availability you have in getting that deluxe pledge and when you'll be able to get it. So my recommendation for this game is if you're not in a rush at all and you don't care and you're on the fence and you don't want the game, wait for retail. If you want the game, and I, like I said, it's a good game, then I do recommend backing at the Deluxe Pledge. You may end up paying more, to be very clear. I'm not saying you won't. You may end up paying more, but I think it's a good game. I think you'll get a lot of good game time out of that game. As far as what's included in the Deluxe Pledge, let's go through some of that. There's more to cover here. So, the Deluxe Pledge over here. So, uh, we have... The big box pledge over here is going to give you the big box. They both come with this instable miniature. They both, they're both they both great, by the way. They're both deluxe to a degree. The deluxe is just more deluxe. Uh, then with more of the cards, the tokens, the wooden guns, all these stuff, all these tiles, ability tiles, ability cards, uh, off-duty signs, which is a mechanic in the game, the badges, which look great, the discard pile, and the deluxe edition gives you all these other things. It gives you deluxe Kraken miniatures in terms of putting the Kraken on the board. It gives you deluxe badges to hand out. These are like incredibly, look at these badges. They're colored, they're three-dimensional, seven by seven. They're Big badges and they're colored chunks of plastic that you can pass around. You'd be like, okay, you're my navigator, you're my lieutenant. Uh, these are the draw and discard piles. So the, the 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 high quality faction ships that go in your bag, 11 sea bags, uh, the deluxe in, in, inlay. There's a lot more going on in the deluxe pledge to justify its value. I think if you, I think if you like this game. This is a game you're going to want. Think Secret Hitler and the big wooden box in Secret Hitler. I think that's what the Deluxe Pledge is probably looking at over here. Something that will be available to a degree, but people are going to like this game and they're going to want that one and it will possibly, especially when it's out of print, when it's between runs, I think it'll sell for, you know, more than its value. Uh, when it's in print is the part where it's a little harder. Uh, one last thing to cover on this game that I want to talk about is the art in this game. Not just the art. The art's amazing. I don't care about that. Well, I do care about that. I like I like amazing art. Rather, the art in this game, in terms of their adoption of real-life people to the game, look at her. She, by the way, this is uh, Board Games for Life, I think. Uh, that's her channel name. Yeah, Game for Life BG. This is her. This is her from, uh, I think, Hell... Uh, I can't remember. I apologize. It was uh, Hella. Hella. So this is Hella from Board Games for Life, or I may have said the name wrong again. Uh, but this is this is her basically. But this looks like a real character, and there's so many of these people, real people, who they incorporated the art, the designers, uh, Nils from from uh, from Fun Tales. They incorporated real people into board games and didn't make them look like garbage, which is I'm so happy with that because. I love the concept of introducing real people to games. I like the idea of having a Sam Healy, a, a Tom Vassell. Put me, put me in a board game. I'll, I'll eventually play it. But I don't like the idea of when you play that character and you look at the card and you're like, oh, this looks off. And I don't want that. I don't want to be in a board game if people don't want to play with my card because that would be, it's, it's make it look good. And this game, the fun tales or the artist here, the artist is, let me see if I can find him over here. Over here, the artist is... I can find it. Hendrik Nowak, I hope I'm saying your name correctly. Uh, he did the art for Glenmore 2, and he did the art here. Absolutely incredible job. The, the way you took real people and blended them so that they not only look good, they look better than they good. Like, they look like real characters in the game. Stellar job. Absolutely a huge fan of that. I find it's rare that games can really incorporate real people into games without compromising on just making it feel weird. And that is Feed the Kraken. And that is Feed the Kraken. There we go. Brick and mortar. Okay. Give me a second here. Water break. So. Cool. 
Brick and Mortar. Brick and Mortar is a game in which uh, this is what you're going to be running a brick and mortar store. This is going to be from a new creator, Nick McCollum, I don't know, from Octodraft Games. And this is one where the game simultaneously looks very interesting. It's also on the expensive side and... Well, it doesn't give you enough exclusive stuff yet to justify that. So, so let's go through that. So this is going to be a game which you're running a brick and mortar store. A game that uh, uh, the concept, which is very dear to my heart, because Board Game Sto is well, we not Board Game Co, not Board Game Sto. Board Game Co is a uh, retail uh, is a we are a retail operation, not brick and mortar, but nonetheless the idea, the principles are interesting to me. And you can pull different stores into your thing. You can run an online store. You can run a thrift store. You can open up a bank, an art studio, or a bakery. You can open up all these different things, and they all have different ways that they that they me have mechanics of the supply and demand or whatnot. Uh, they were both, uh, what's it called, both Rado as well as Stella Short and Sweet uh, had pretty positive reviews, and if you keep going down, there's even more positive reviews from other people. By the way, Stella Short and Sweet, in general, if you haven't subscribed to Meeple University, I highly recommend subscribing. She has great content both on her short, short and sweet segments, which I particularly enjoy because they are, like they say, short and sweet uh, deliveries of a game for all those people who talk about how my videos can be too long, hers are not. Uh, and additionally, her rules explanations I find to be incredibly well done and incredibly concise, also completely solid. Speaking of which, if you wanted for a Neomorphosis, if you want to get an idea of the gameplay, she had a, or they, uh, both her and her husband had a gameplay uh, of, of how to play Neomorphosis, which was, again, great job. Highly recommend Meeple University. Check out her content. Going back to Brick and Mortar, Brick and Mortar has a lot of interesting applications of, of supply and demand and enough reviews that I believe it is a good game. Uh, the problem with it, and I'm interested, I plan on checking this out for myself down the road. Again, near and dear to my heart, totally interested in the game. Uh, as far as the pledge levels, unfortunately, they're coming in at $59 for getting a copy of the game, plus all unlocked stretch goals. So all unlocked stretch goals is always a question of what are you unlocking, and plus shipping, by the way. And so in terms of what you're unlocking over here, I, they so far only had one uh, actual Kickstarter exclusive stretch goal unlocked. They have Brick and Mortis funded, reference cards, custom shaped screen meeples. Keep going down over here. Actually, I don't think they even had the unlocked yet. Over here, they have the, these two over here. So spot UV on the game box and unique artwork for player boards are going to be Kickstarter exclusive. That is a decent amount of money plus shipping to get a game that if it makes its way to retail will be cheaper uh the flip side is with currently 355 backers there's no guarantee this will hit retail i don't know if that's enough enough adoption for us to be certain that you'll see it in retail stores uh in terms of what you should do uh, my recommendation is if you are on the fence about you really want this game so if you really want this game back the game i think you're probably overpaying but there may not be an alternative to get the game later uh if you're not particularly sold in the game it's probably unfortunately worth passing because if you like, if you're not going to miss out on it, it will probably be cheap, available cheaper at retail. Obviously, to take into account supporting the creator and any of those reasons as well. Uh, for myself, I haven't decided. I'm leaning towards no, but I I kind of want a copy of the game. I just again brick and mortar. Uh, running a uh, running a store is a, a concept that is near and dear to me, and I am interested in the game because of that. But that doesn't mean it's necessarily a good back, unfortunately. Moving on from there, we have Atlantis Rising Monstrosities. Atlantis Rising Monstrosities is basically a the newest game from Elf Creek Games. Uh, I've, my last video on them was, I want to say, Merchants of the Dark Road, which I am so looking forward to that one. We actually just talked about both Elf Creek Games and Atlantis Rising and Merchants of the Dark Road on our Quackalope, the weekly quack podcast, link down below. It's a good plug. Great podcast. Listen to that one. Talk about a lot of fun things, including, in fact, I'll plug it again at the end because there's another fun thing on there. But in any case, Atlantis Rising is going to be the Kickstarter this is the Monstrosities expansion to Atlantis Rising, and it's going to be a bunch. It's going to be more of the more stuff to your Atlantis Rising game. If you like Atlantis Rising, which is a well-rated game, I think this is like an 8.0 on Board Game Geek. I could be wrong with that. Double check it yourself. But it is a well-rated game that I know a lot of people who like solo games. Jeremy Howard, Z Garcia, even Tom Vassell, whatever it is. And this is not so sorry. I said solo game, solo or cooperative games. They all gave it stellar ratings. Uh, lots of other people, uh, Ido from Game with Ido. There's lots and lots of people who have given this game a stellar reviews. Uh, myself, I've played the base game. I like it a lot. I kind of want to get it back. Uh, I did eventually trade it away, but I kind of want to get it back because, well, it's a good game with stellar, stellar production value, and I am I don't even care about the expansion, by the way, to be clear. It's not the expansion that's making me want to get it back. I just have second thoughts because I'm seeing it all. I'm like, and I'm remembering how much fun it was to play when we did play it. So, yeah, I'm having second thoughts there. Uh, in terms of the pledge levels, pledge levels are going to come at a few things. So, to begin with, we have, let me see if I can scroll this properly. So, 
we have over here for one dollar access to the pledge manager for fifteen dollars retail for twenty nine dollars you get the ally monstrosities expansion if you're in the u.s this will ship for four dollars that's going to bring it roughly in line with the retail price uh, they didn't have official msrp but if you extrapolate back from the base game of uh, how they price it that one compared to retail the twenty nine dollars plus four dollars shipping is going to be roughly in line with what you can get it if you're buying it at your local online game store additionally you will get some kickstarter exclusive stuff uh, so far they just have a custom meeple set an alternate meeple set for kickstarter backers that's the one thing you're getting that's exclusive as of now uh we have days left so we know 12 we have 12 days left something like that so we have let me see if i can pull this up here we have 12 days to go so you know there might be there may well be more exclusive stuff added which will obviously increase the level of deal additionally their games because they are in high demand because their games are hard to get your hands on people like them they regularly go through print runs being out so my recommendation is if you like atlantis rising my recommendation is just jump in on monstrosities it's going to be a decent price not as of right now until more stuff is unlocked it's not an amazing price it's a decent price uh but if more stuff is unlocked it's only going to add and additionally you don't want to be paying through the nose both in those first few months until it hits retail as well as down the road when it what's it called as well as down the road when it's uh between print runs or anything like that uh, additionally you can get the base game as well you can get the base game for 54 dollars. you can get the two of them together for 79 dollars, which is like a three four dollar discount of the two and you can get the all in uh with everything with the deluxe components and play mat set for 125 dollars. that is a deal if you want those those things are more expensive at retail you're saving like another 10 bucks there or not or, or so somewhere in that range so overall uh, if you're interested in the game i recommend checking this out and getting it here this is a good price and a good time to get your hands on it uh, for the most part not necessarily an amazing deal across the board but small savings here and there as you go through it and that is atlantis rising star scrappers orbital this is one that i was super excited about and i am still excited about it but i'm excited about it at retail now this is from the designer of terraforming mars and a lot of i saw a comment that particularly resonated with me which is it is you know terraforming mars combined with galaxy truckers that concept appeals to me and if you see the way these cars are laid out you can totally believe that let me see if i can find a picture of you can see how you're kind of building modules of a ship using cars so it is a hybrid of terraforming mars and galaxy trucker uh, the art looks amazing uh, hexi studios have done a tremendous job at the presentation of this game and i I'm really looking forward to actually getting my hands on a copy and playing this game because, well, it's the design of Terraforming Mars. It combines Gas Trucker and, and Terraforming Mars to a degree. Those are all things that hook me on it. Uh, the reason I am not currently backing it, and I use the word currently, I'm still keeping an eye on the campaign, is because of the fact that if you look at the pledge levels, we have $38 for the core set, which is going to give you the Orbital plus the Envoys expansion. Okay, that's going to be $38 plus shipping. This game will be cheaper than that in retail, and the thing you are getting is the Envoys expansion, which you're paying about 10 15 bucks for roughly it depends how much it actually ends up being in retail but roughly in that range uh 10 15 bucks for a promo set roughly of cards that may well be available let's say no i was about to say it's gonna be available on board game geek but it says kickstarter exclusive so it will not be available on board game geek uh, hopefully um but kickstarter exclusive so you're paying about 10 15 bucks to get a set of roughly 10 cards i don't know if they're going to be releasing more than these we currently have seven unlocked i don't know if this three means three more or if they have plans to update it even further that's one of the things i plan on keeping an eye on because uh, 10 bucks for 10 promo cars on a game that i haven't seen enough reviews on to know whether it's a game for me is a risk that i'm fine passing on uh, if it's if it's a success there will be plenty of other cards and expansions added down the road so i'm kind of just waiting to retail despite being uh, in incredibly interested in the game that being said i don't think it's a terrible price you're paying like 10 15 bucks more for the game to get your hands on it early so it's not like this is you know it's not like the worst thing ever it's just and, and you're getting the promo pack for it uh, for me it's just i'm i'm willing to wait but it, it's again not a terrible buy not a particularly good buy you're paying a little more but they're giving you a promo pack uh, at 55 dollars 55 euros or 66 dollars you get the deluxe crew expansion which is going to give you the exclusive crew which is basically 25 organic glass astronauts now i believe organic glass is ac is uh, acrylic so i believe it's 25 acrylic astronauts based on googling it i saw someone else say it's plastic so i'm not sure if it's acrylic or plastic or either way point is i kind of just don't really care i'm totally fine with those meeples i don't need this is not a game where i particularly care about having standees i'm generally not a fan of standees to begin with i prefer well miniatures or meeples so that is uh star scrappers orbital basically you know overall you know it's well overall looks like a great game from a designer who we know has his chops or whatnot and the price point is just a little more than i feel the need to pay but you are getting a promotional set out of it from there, we have the Mariana Trench. And the Mariana Trench, uh, Trench is one that... Okay, so this is one that we have age 39 backers, $22,000. This is going to be by Tristan uh, Tristan Rossum, who actually, by the way, fun fact, is a designer, uh, not designer, is an artist on Brick and Mortar. So he's involved in two of these projects today. 
but the Mariana Trench is going to be their first created project. It is a light, uh, I believe it's cooperative as well, but everyone I've seen so far has been talking about it more like a solo game. So it's a solo or two player pocket size game. There we go. And so you're basically, you know, navigating the ship underwater. It kind of has like a card row similar to, um, similar to uh, Space Hulk Death Angel, a card game. Gameplay seems totally different, but that card or aspect looks similar. You're gonna be moving your 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 submarine your submarine up and down, ca capturing sea beasts, upgrading your sub, doing different things. Uh, lo looks super intriguing. The biggest problem with it is just the price point compared to the box, but there are extras to compensate. So if you look at that, it's going to be uh, eight to twenty four dollars to get the Mariana Trench base game, including the core game and all applicable stretch goals. A game this size at retail is probably gonna be closer to the range of like. 12 bucks, maybe 15 bucks. It's a small game. Uh, the good news to cover that gap, you're going to get some things, which are basically you're going to get a Kickstarter expansion and a Kickstarter. So there's going to be the, let's see if we can find it here. The Creatures expansion is going to be available to all backers. It is not Kickstarter exclusive. And you'll be getting the uh, the 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, a Kickstarter exclusive character to, you know, command the ma mas command of Master Submariner Captain Nemo. So you're going to get some Kickstarter exclusive and an expansion. And then they're still unlocking things as the campaign continues to grow. I would say if you're interested, take a look. The difference in pricing you're looking at here is not significant. Is it a good back? It's not a great back, but also again, not a big gap in terms of that extra monetary difference. This is the nature of smaller games on Kickstarter. It is unfortunately harder to provide a good deal, just the nature of logistics. Uh, again, you're talking about a handful of bucks. So if you're interested, feel free to take the plunge, support the creator. That being said, you're probably not going to see your full pledge back on this one. Next up, we have Pachacuna. Pachacuna, I just put a review of this game. So this is this is the llama game, or alpaca. I saw someone say it's alpaca, so if it's alpacas, I apologize. But this is basically by, I don't remember the name, uh, Tree Triceratops. This is by a company, the Triceratops. They have one main game that they've created in the past. They have other games they've done, but I think the main one that I was looking at was, if I could look over here, was Darwin's Choice. And we're going to reference that in terms of the value aspect. But before we get into that, the game itself is a two-player abstract game in which you are navigating the valleys with your llamas or alpacas. In terms of one player can navigate along the mountains, one player can navigate along the valleys, and you can be moving back and forth and figuring all that out in terms of trying to get from village to village in a pickup and deliver a game. Uh, the, uh, you're going to be constantly turning your tiles, you're going to be getting resources, trading them in for llamas, doing lots of fun things. Overall, I really liked the game. I thought it was a lot of fun. We played it a bunch of times, enjoyed the experience. Uh, for myself, uh, I was concerned that the setup, the setup was a little tedious, and some aspects of the gameplay could devolve into a little back and forth. But overall, a solid experience. If you are if you are interested in it, I recommend and checking it out while also not feeling that it is my favorite abstract. Uh, in terms of the campaign itself, I believe it'll hold its value hard to know entirely. So I saw a lot of comments on the price. In terms of addressing the price, yes, it's expensive, but these are dual, like they, those are two dual layer tiles that are really premium and chunky feel, even in the prototype. I can't even imagine what the final product is going to be like. So I can totally buy into the price. Now that keep in mind, that just justifies why the price is what the price is. It does not justify whether you are willing to pay that price for this game. That is a personal determination. In terms of holding its value, looking at their class, looking at Darwin's choice, looking at how that, that one has been done, overall that has held its value decently. Not a particular amazing back, but this is not one that's going to fly into retail and be sold down the road in terms of for $20 less or whatever. So I think it's an okay back, not a great back, not a bad back. I think it's an okay back. You might lose a few bucks. If you're trying to sell it to yourself, you may not get your full money back. But in terms of your options to get it now versus later, I think this is a decent option to get it now. Uh, that, I believe, covers everything in the video, which leads us to the things coming next week. So, introducing Kapow, a fast and furious buildable dice superhero game. So these are four campaigns that are coming next week in the next seven days that will be, uh, what's it called? These are coming in the next seven days. There's going to be like 14 campaigns in the next seven days, but these are the four I picked out to talk about. So first of all, there's Kapow by White Wizard Games. These are the same people who brought you Star Realms. That's what they're, what they're most known for. This is a building dice crafting superhero game. I'm simultaneously intrigued. Uh, the art on the dice itself is not pulling me in, so I wonder how, what the final product looks like. But the concept of a dice drafting hero game looks interesting to me color me intrigued i will obviously cover it and let you know more next week uh, next up we have elf room uh, uh, side room games is bringing you elements of the gods elements of the gods is their newest game i don't know much about this game i just know it looks pretty and side creek games has side room games has had a few different uh games under the belt that have been decently rated so i am definitely color me intrigued on this one we'll see how it plays out Next up, we have the Big Box Pursuit of Happiness. Big Box is coming to Kickstarter November 10th. This is going to cover you all your Pursuit of Happiness stuff in one giant box for your consumption. And finally, and most importantly, 
is Burn Cycle. Burn Cycle, which is my other plug for the podcast with Jeremy Howard. We talked about uh, Burn Cycle on the podcast, so feel free to jump in there. I, uh, this one is actually, this one I am super excited about. I cannot tell you how excited about it. Well, I could tell you. I'm super excited about it. This is coming November 10th, and I would keep talking about it, but I have 14 seconds left in order to stay in that 43-minute mark that I promised you at the beginning. So, I am Alex Radcliffe from Board Game Co. I hope you enjoyed this video. Until next time, have a good one. So, fun fact, um, I forgot to do my rush to hit the 43-minute mark. I forgot to talk about the Tabletopia aspect. Uh, games available on Tabletopia from games I talked about this week, however briefly. We have Penny Dreadfun, Scores of the Seas, Freedom 5, Endless Winter, Dire Alliance, Townfolk Tussle, and Brick and Mortar has a coming soon uh, available to Tabletopia. Uh, when I say Tabletopia, I mean Tabletop Simulator or Tabletopia, so either one of those. Uh, past that, I didn't actually prep much in terms of a uh, secret behind-the-scenes stuff this week. Um, I will tell you that in about an hour or two from when I do this video, I will be playing Burn Cycle on uh, Tabletop Simulator with uh, too many with Chip Theory games, so you can expect my thoughts on that. I am super excited. I've seen a few people who have also played it, and they have basically said stellar things about it. I mean, this is Chip Theory games. Their, their only dud for me so far has been um, that lock-picking game, Trip Lock. Trip Lock was a bit of a dud for me. Uh, too Many Bones, one of my favorite games of all times. Hoplomachus was a great great series of games that I just prefer Too Many Bones, so I just kept Too Many Bones, and I hear tons of the good things about Cloudspire, yet to actually play my copy, color me immensely sad about that, I need to get that one to the table. But this one, the good news about Burn Cycle, is because I'm playing it today, when I eventually get my hands on a copy, I will already know the rules, which is half the battle, I already have played it, so I am super excited for more stuff from Chip 30 Games, uh, different universes, this feels very different from them, this feels like, you know, they have Orange, Board Game Co. loves Orange, and, and Blue, my last chance to wear... A polo. It's getting cold outside, but today was a nice day, so I did the yard work and whatnot, and I'm wearing a polo just because I want to wear short sleeves again, however long I could. That's basically it. I'm just playing Burn Cycle later today. That's as, that's as close as I can get to anything exciting. I, I wanted to prep a song. I didn't have a lot of time, but that's basically it. Until next time, um, I will see you later, and, and thanks for sticking around as usual, and have a good one.